so good afternoon, everyone. We still have uh, people joining our webinar. We will start in about two minutes. So it's uh, good to have you all with us. Okay, so good afternoon, dear friends. I think we can start now. Uh, I see that we have still a few people joining, but uh, you will not miss anything. So uh, I would like to say hello and welcome to dear friends of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, the Stockholm International Water Institute, CV, and the International Center for Water Cooperation, ICWC, which is a category two center hosted by CV under the auspices of UNESCO. Many of you probably know CV, as, which is a water institute and very famous for organizing the annual World Water Week. And it is my pleasure to share with you the news that the 2021 World Water Week will be digital. It will be held online. So it will be an opportunity for many more participants to join and attend the different events. So we look forward to seeing you there in August. And uh, now a little bit to this water dialogue webinar. Uh, we will focus here on tracing intersections of COVID-19, gender, water and armed conflicts. Uh, this uh, water dialogue is co-hosted by UI, CV and ICWC. And the water dialogue series aims to deepen understanding of water as a catalyst for strengthening peace and security in fragile and conflict affected states. You know that CV is not only an organization that organizes World Water Week, we also work with a wide range of water related issues from uh, water and sanitation, water resource management, transboundary water cooperation, and water and peace issues. And this webinar follows up on a paper that I co authored with uh, my colleagues at CV, Alexandra Said and Panchali Saikia, who are the speakers here. And the paper is, uh, was published by UI and is available on UI's website. And in that paper, we look into the, how a combination of prolonged instability, weak institutions, hampers the ability of fragile and conflict affected states to deliver basic healthcare and wash services. And how is this worsened by health crisis? And uh, we look into the gap, how the gap in delivery of basic services in some states is used by armed non-state actors who seek opportunities to fill this void to demonstrate their non-military roles. And this is really something to do with their, their seeking to augment their legitimacy. And in this context, our main focus was on women. How, are the, how this situation affects women, but also what is the role of women as agents of change? And when we started looking into these issues, we really find uh, very interesting results. And uh, we also are very happy to have a speaker from Yemen here with us, Mona Lukman, who will really say more about the situation in her home country. And now, without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Sophie Berklund from UI, uh, Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Sophie is a program manager and analyst of the Global Politics and Security Program. And Sophie will moderate today's event, and she will also be the one who will navigate the questions and answers. So I hope you enjoy the webinar. And should you have any questions in the future, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. So enjoy. 
Thank you so much, Martina. And um, before I introduce you to our very distinguished panel, I would like to uh, take a moment to thank you all for tuning in. I know based on your answer, it's in the, in the sign-up form uh, that a lot of you are working in this field yourselves um, or are students or academic in academics in related fields uh, or even personally uh, affected by this issue. Uh, and just to read two comments of why you have chosen to join us today, which I feel really capture the theme of the webinar really well, um, is that it is a timely topic with aspects that are too often overlooked in favor of hard security issues. Uh, and the second one is that the connection between water and conflict is um, often discussed, but that the gender relations are often left out and remain unclear. And that is what we are here to sort out today. Um, and I have also been able to see that we are participants. We have participants joining from all continents uh, apart from Antarctica. <laughs> so very happy to have you here. Um, so on behalf of the panel, uh, CV and UI, thank you for tuning in to discuss this with us. Uh, and as Martina said, uh, please ask your questions and write your comments in the Q&A field here on Zoom. Uh, and I will make sure to leave lots of room in the end of this webinar uh, for the panel to respond to your thoughts. Uh, and without further ado, allow me to introduce you to our panel. Uh, first, we have uh, Mona Lukma, uh, who is our keynote speaker tonight. And Mona is the founder and chairperson of Food for Humanity and the co-founder of Women's Solidarity Network. And she's also a member of the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership. And Muna has briefed the UN Security Council, members of Congress and U uh, UN Human Rights Council together with UNEP, uh, WILP and ICANN among others uh, to stop the war and advocate for women's participa participation in the peace process in Yemen. And Muna is also the award recipient of the eighth International Young Women's Peace Award and a non-resident research fellow at the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at San Diego University. So a very distinguished guest. We are so happy to have you here, Muna. Uh, and as I mentioned, we also have two uh, experts from CIVI here. Uh, first, we have Alexandra Said, who serves as program officer for the Transboundary Water Cooperation Department at CIVI. And she has a special focus on gender and security, inclusive processes, and the Nile Basin. Um, so be sure to ask her questions related to gender and security. And finally, on the panel, we have Panchali Saikia, who is a program officer at the Water and Sanitation Department at CV. And her expertise lies in international relations, institutions, and gender in, uh, in water governance and transboundary rivers. Uh, so Panchali is the person to ask about wash services, among other things, of course. Um, yeah, we have an exciting afternoon ahead. So to set the tone for this discussion, I will now give the floor to Muna for her keynote speech. <clears throat> Thank you, Sophie. Uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, um, it's an honor to be here uh, on the International Day on Preventing the Exploitation um, of the environment in war and conflict, which is an opportunity for environmentalists and peace practitioners to reflect together on the war and the role of the war in damaging natural environments caused by armed com conflict. The devastation of war and conflict in Yemen uh, goes even further than those uh, who have lost their lives, wounded soldiers and civilians, destroyed cities and livelihoods. The environments in which people live in Yemen have also become a victim of war, a forgotten victim of war. Water wells are polluted, crops are torched, trees cut down, soils poisoned, and animals killed to gain military advantage in some territories. Additionally, as the COVID-19 pandemic has affected lives everywhere in the world, but it has significantly affected people in conflict and fragile countries such as Yemen. I remember during the outbreak of COVID-19 around the world, I was watching the impact of the pandemic in highly developed countries and I was terrified. I was terrified of what could happen in Yemen where there have been attacks on water systems, 
bombing of hospitals and infrastructure, which in turn has intensified struggles over resources and created tensions and conflict within a conflict. Last year, I spoke at the World Water Week in Stockholm. And at that time, people in Yemen were facing a di dire situation where families still today are forced to see their children die from preventable diseases such as cholera. Today, our situation has deteriorated dramatically. The danger to children and their families in Yemen is compounded by general low immunity, uh, high levels of malnutrition among the children, a lack of regular access to basic services, and devastated healthcare system in general. Recent flooding in Yemen has decreased um, road, uh, road accessibility, polluted uh, reservoirs, and increased the uh, number of internally displaced people. IDP, IDP camps in Yemen uh, represent also a high risk for the spread of COVID-19. Um, I've seen um, in many areas water contamination from the flooding, which has exasperated the spread of cholera. Um, we saw this in the city of Aden and in Hodeida specifically, um, and this has also uh, disproportionately affected women uh, due to their um, caregiving role and uh, collecting unclean water. Meanwhile, though, uh, Yemeni women have taken the lead in peace building at the community level, negotiating local ceasefires, facilitating humanitarian access, um, mediating conflicts over land and water resources. I myself have been involved in many of um, the water um, uh, conflicts um, resolution there. Um, we were the first to also warn of the crisis and call for a ceasefire because without the, um, without the ceasefire, um, we, we cannot really focus on combating COVID-19 or anything uh, else. Um, so Food for Humanity started um, preparing early into the crisis by um, supporting laboratories and hospitals with the PCR equipment, supplies, uh, medical equipment, fuel and oxygen. We have also trained um, hundreds of young medics uh, who were the first responders during the outbreak. We're also continuing our Water for Peace program, fixing water wells and uh, hand wash uh, stations. Because in Yemen, um, one of the things that was also very terrifying for me and my colleagues is that how can we advise people to wash their hands when they don't have access to, to water or safe water? Um, so this was something that we started in April. Uh, it is a continuation of our Water for Peace project. And I'm proud to say that we have succeeded in providing more than 20,000 families with our own efforts with clean water um, uh, and uh, clean and safe water. Our members at the Women's Solidarity uh, Network have been facilitating also negotiations uh, and mediating uh, um, on armed conflicts in, in Yemen because we have so many uh, smaller conflicts within Yemen which are really um, affecting the lives of the people. This work um, of uh, women-led organization, uh, unfortunately is done with limited resources limited funding as they face uh, difficulty accessing the uh, UN pool of uh, humanitarian funding. In ending, I would like to share the following recommendations. Um, we call on the parties to adhere to an emergency uh, ground and aerial ceasefire to allow health and aid workers to work in safety and ensure that civilians in conflict uh, zones are, not, um, are able to access the medical care uh, and um, uh, ensure the unimpeded delivery of medical supplies. Um, also to prioritize an inclusive, transparent and accountable peace process, which, um, which um, includes uh, people of political backgrounds from all regions of Yemen, including the Southern um, uh, areas. Um, to support a separate uh, COVID-19 pandemic humanitarian appeal and a response which is coordinated and um, led by uh, the women organizations uh, who are calling for accountability uh, of the distribution of aid. Um, um, I would also like to uh, recommend that, that um, humanitarian aid funding goes more to targeting um, livelihood restoration uh, programs and um, assisting the Yemenis who have not, many of them have lost their livelihoods and others um, are not able to provide for their families because they have not paid, been paid their salaries for the past three years. So please, I um, would like to just um, take this opportunity um, to um, ask you all to join our call to end the suffering 
um, and bring uh, peace back to Yemen. Um, guns cannot silence the pandemic, only peace can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Muna. If I could just pick up on a few uh, topics that you mentioned before um, letting Alexandra and Panchali in, in on the conversation. Um, you mentioned women's role as, um, as caregivers, as central, but if you would like to elaborate a little bit, um, why are women-led organizations so central in situations such as the one in Yemen? I think that um, the women have always been um, um, very active in Yemen. Um, and I think this is actually true all around the world, especially where in areas where we've seen uh, conflict. And um, I have um, um, seen women uh, just taking the responsibility. I think it's just something spontaneous, first of all. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, they're not the ones who are really creating the violence. Um, and so, but they are taking the responsibility. Um, and I think they are critical to the peace process, to, to um, development, to all areas. Because first of all, they have very good access to the people they are trusted credible um, and um, and they achieve and um, and we need them we need them in the um, in the peace process especially because we are uh, only um, I mean just having the uh, the violent ones in the peace process is not enough it will not bring peace back and do you feel like women are invited to the table when it comes to um, discussing water issues and discussing the pandemic and discussing at the peace um, negotiation table? I'm afraid to say no. Uh, unfortunately, they uh, they have. Um, I mean, despite all the efforts that the women have done in Yemen, uh, in all aspects, they have they have been excluded um, from from everything really. Uh, but I would like to say that we have claimed our space. We're not waiting for anybody to invite us anymore. Uh, we just um, uh, we just pop up wherever we hear there is something, and we're uh, yeah. Very good. Um, I want to turn to Alexandra and Panchali at this point because you have co-written the paper uh, we mentioned earlier on disease, water, gender and conflict. Um, and before we go more into details on uh, on your study and your findings, um, I want to ask why why you chose this to write about this topic at this point, perhaps starting with Alexandra. Uh, thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, why we chose this topic was that initially we were discussing the pandemic, as I'm sure many others were, especially working in this field of development. And we were talking about how we're seeing that the effects of the pandemic are hitting women hardest, uh, even in, like Muna said, in the developing world uh, or, uh, you know, like in uh, countries where they're not really fragile or conflict affected regions and so on and so how how would that how would that also then affect women who are actually living in these fragile and conflict affected regions or states so we started talking about that and looking into it and, and then uh, like Martina said we also saw in you know like the, the results were quite shocking because we saw that, okay, this is the similarities in uh, previous disease outbreaks so we started looking into cholera uh, and uh, Ebola and so on. So that was the main, like just trying to look at how does it affect women in this specific context where it's not only being a woman, but it's also being a woman in a fragile and conflict affected setting. Uh, that was the main initial idea. And Panchali, maybe you want to also add to that? Yes, uh, thank you. Just to touch upon a bit on uh, what you had mentioned and complement on that. Uh, I think one of the key issues that Mona had already mentioned about how do we really ask people to follow the health guidelines and recommendations of uh, keeping hygiene and hand washing when people don't have access to good quality uh, water and also not just good quality, at, at least with uh, accessibility itself. Uh, the second, of course, it's uh, about how uh, in conflict affected regions, it's, it's not just uh, having the accessibility, but there are other hindering factors uh, with conflict, uh, the destructions of water stations, or aid agencies not being able to go to different regions. Uh, that puts a lot of uh, pressure and challenges uh, for armed conflict and fragile um, 
context states. So these were some of the issues that we are looking into and also in respect to women, we also see from the previous uh, monitoring data around uh, WASH that you see uh, how women are the key primary responsible um, person in terms of uh, collections of drinking water for the household. So these are some of the issues that we really wanted to investigate and see how this has been uh, picturing in during the pandemic. And then we also saw that in certain countries, there were also not just the pandemic uh, itself of COVID-19, but there were like Muna was mentioning, there were like other uh, health crises, also other uh, climate disasters like floods. So it's kind of like a country facing different uncertainties, shocks and stresses at the same time. So there were a lot of challenges and we wa really wanted to push and see uh, and investigate and do something about more as uh, coming up as to be building awareness and talking about the issues uh, in this uh, interlinking uh, context. So that was one of the main visions that we thought of, yes, writing something on this. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could follow up on that, Panchali, because um, in this study you choose to illustrate this issue with examples from the MENA region. Uh, so why did you choose that region to um, illustrate your arguments? And what can you say about the access to WASH services in MENA? And perhaps um, first explain to those who might not be in the field, what does WASH in entail? Thank you, Sophie. Uh, yes, I mean, by WASH, we mean it's uh, water sanitation and hygiene uh, sector. Uh, in MENA, we have been, CB have been working together with UNICEF uh, uh, in the WASH sector, uh, more towards looking into improved water governance. Uh, and then when we were trying to look into this whole intersections and uh, what Alexandra and Muna, they were mentioning about, uh, we also see that MENA is one of the regions where you have uh, it's a water scarce reason uh, in terms of when we're talking about accessibility to um, water uh, by people. You see that almost like 60% of people uh, live in water stressed area, which is almost uh, double the global average of about 35%. Uh, this is based on a World Bank study. So the rise of demand for hand washing during COVID could uh, exacerbate the region's water insecurity, right? By uh, rising the water consumption. Uh, and also a lot of people might not have that uh, uh, access to different sources. The other thing we were also looking into the fragile and non-fragile context. Um, I'll, I'll share a bit uh, a, a bit of data here. Uh, there is this uh, WHO UNICEF joint monitoring program which monitors data around WASH. So that really shows a comparison between fragile and non-fragile context on access to WASH services. Uh, if I give an example of about 63% people have access to drinking water and 41% basic sanitation uh, in, in fragile context when you compare to non-fragile states, which is uh, about 90% to 70% respectively. So there is a huge difference when even we look into fragile and non-fragile context. Then there is also the issues that we had already talked about and I had mentioned in terms of um, the armed conflict, like where you have uh, the water infrastructure has been um, disrupted or there has been some disruptions to the services where the cities uh, are not able to get. There has been certain incidents in, uh, in MENA in the governorate's um, in Syria that we saw uh, the cities were not able to access the water because the uh, water stations, uh, Alok water stations were yeah, destructed due to conflict. Uh, the second thing that I had earlier mentioned about, I'll also share a bit of data on that just to get more uh, context uh, clarity on that. It's about when I was mentioning as women as the primary uh, responsible for water collections. Uh, there is this example I would like to share about from Yemen uh, in the rural context. Uh, nearly like 40% of the women were responsible uh, in collection of drinking water in ratio to 5% men. Uh, and then this is based on data that uh, talks about the states where at least one uh, in 10 households collect water from off the premises, household premises. So this is like a huge, you will see it across a lot of uh, conflict affected and fragile states that uh, women are actually still the primary responsible and they have to go through a lot of hurdles in accessing water points, covering distances. Uh, just giving one more example, not specific to MENA, but also from uh, the previous uh, Ebola crisis um, in Congo, uh, the Red Cross had done some analysis that showed that um, due to increasing uh, hygiene need and more consumption of water, women and young girls had to travel more frequently 
uh, as compared to their previous times to fetch water. So there is a lot of uh, things that really health crisis put um, on women and young girls to uh, really be able to, uh, not just about what Muna was mentioning about the care, but also talking about the responsibility in the household to get water uh, for their household. So these are some of the issues that we were looking into. Um, of course, I would like to mention more if there is time, but maybe later on as well. They, this also was something we at CV was doing with UNICEF during the pandemic was mapping some of the wash responses in countries and MENA was one of those regions. And I can share further during the discussion some of the findings around that. Yes, um, let's talk about what the CV is doing a little bit later on. But first, I wanted to talk, uh, turn to you, Mona, and ask what are your first hand experiences from disease outbreaks in fragile, still, fragile states? And do you recognize what Panchali is talk, telling us here? Yes, definitely, uh, Sophie. Panchali has really touched on um, uh, really important. Um, Matters. I mean, uh, we've had in, in one of the stations that we uh, made, one of the water stations recently, um, they had to walk for eight hours. Um, and I remember getting a message from somebody uh, from that village uh, telling me that even the pregnant women go um, to carry the water at two o'clock in the morning. Can you imagine that? Uh, I'm walking for hours because that's the time where usually the, the water is collected at the at the. Um, and so it's it's such a, a very uh, difficult uh, life and there's also a lot of gender-based violence uh, included uh, because there's a lot of harassment while they go to collect the water and it's just uh, so, so much devastation there um, re regarding your question about the conflict um, fragile areas well i what i see is that the first responders are always the women and then comes in the youth and, and actually the women are the ones who are mobilizing even the youth um, and, and, and for instance, in, in April, when, um, when COVID-19 started hitting in, in, um, in Yemen, um, there was no government. The government uh, didn't really care what was going on in Yemen and what they were too busy fighting uh, and mobilizing their own uh, fighters to fight their own people. Um, the uh, Houthi rebels were also uh, trying to, anybody who had COVID-19, they, they would arrest them and they would use a militarized uh, approach to it. Um, and and the, the nurses didn't have any PPE uh, gear. The hospitals didn't have any um, separators uh, to eliminate any, um, uh, any spread of the COVID-19 inside the actual laboratories or in the hospitals. It was devastating. No electricity, no water, nothing. So what I really see is that, I mean, even the WHO with all due respect, what they intervened is after a very long time, and um, and so I mean um, and even until now it's still not the the response is still not uh, adequate. So I'm just saying that in in conflict um, uh, areas it's always the women who take the lead. And I'm not here just defending the women. I'm speaking about effectiveness of the humanitarian programming. Are we if efficient enough uh, to respond in these kind of crises? I mean I'm um, I would have thought that um, during the Ebola crisis that we have you know, at least learned a lot of lessons uh, from that, but it turned out uh, that uh, we didn't learn enough. Uh, yeah, Yemeni women uh, would have expanded their response much more if they had been funded and supported and had enough resources, not just um, the money, but also resources, expert uh, expertise and support. Uh, if, um, uh, But unfortunately still, it's always um, a late approach when we start thinking that, yeah, we should have um, supported the local, um, the locals. So I'm, I'm not saying that we are also, uh, we can do this on our own. It should be something which is harmonized. Um, we should be working together, collaborating together, international organizations and uh, the local, uh, the local uh, organizations. Yes, and I want to go more into the role of state actors in just a minute, but you touched uh, upon something that you also write about in your, um, in your paper. Uh, and I want to turn to Alexandra now. And uh, as Mona was saying, when there's no government taking charge, we, also, we, see, we often see women taking the lead on these issues. But what you write about in your paper is that we also see uh, non-state actors uh, who take advantage of the situation. So Alexandra, would you like to elaborate on that a bit?
Yes, uh, thank you, Sophie. So, um, looking into you know armed state, uh, armed non-state actors, uh, and in this conflict uh, and fragile affected states, then we saw that in the three case studies that we looked into, it's Syria, Yemen, and um, Iraq, and these three states have already been suffering for, because of armed conflicts, but also water, uh, you know, water issues such, such as flooding or droughts and so on. Uh, but then we saw that they were actually responding to the pandemic to try to gain legitimacy as, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, as uh, they were trying to fill a state function or state-like functions. Uh, and when the governments cannot or do not want to provide these uh, services, such as health services or wash services, and then they try to, to step in there to show that we're not only fighters, we're not only armed, we're also trying to take care of the people. Uh, so they did this in, you know, all three countries. We saw that. We saw in many other countries, but these are the three case studies that, that we looked into. Uh, so, for example, they do in... in um, in, they do information campaigns uh, and they provide water and sanitation services or in some cases protection uh, equipment. Uh, in northern Syria, uh, the, the so-called salvation government, they for example banned public gatherings and they even sprayed disinfectants in, in mosques. Uh, and just two weeks ago they released a, a new series of public health posters online to the people. Um, Islamic State in Syria also called for example to prisoners of al Hol camp, which is one of the biggest uh, camps in Syria, uh, and the majority, who are, they are actually women and children affiliated with the uh, Islamic State's uh, fighters. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the Rojava Information Center released a report last month stating that there's only 59 intensive care units or beds in northeast Syria. And even fewer ventilators, and there's an acute shortage of testing kits, medical supplies, protective equipment generally, and there's also an increase of confirmed COVID-19 cases in these camps, uh, and they don't, and other IDP camps, uh, inter internally displaced person camps, uh, they don't have isolation facility or even trained staff to deal with this kind of issue. So this, you know, th this is then where they, these all non-state actors take the opportunity to come in and either in, uh, try to instigate violence. Uh, or, you know, to, for example, in uh, the, in Iraq, the Islamic State made statements that the Iraqi government is weak now, or that the Iraqi military is weak now. So they're trying to use this um, opportunity opportunity where these states are busy tackling the pandemic. They're trying to maybe gain control or increase their attacks and try to convince the populations that the states cannot provide provide this care for you, but we can. And, this, uh, and when there's such an instability uh, in the region, and then you add on uh, the, uh, the pandemic and the healthcare crisis, then this provides uh, an opportunity for these all non-state actors to actually recruit new members. Uh, and this was confirmed in a recently re uh, released report, it was released just a few days ago, uh, by the uh, US Department of uh, Defense. And the lead inspector general um, wrote in this uh, report to the US Congress that uh, the Islamic State is trying to recruit new members uh, in Al Hol camp uh, because there's a lot of discontent and the, the, the you know the, the pandemic is spreading there as well. So they're taking this opportunity, and this is important to highlight. And that th this is actually what they're trying to do. They're trying to gain le legitimacy by using the, the health emergency coming from uh, the pandemic. What would you say is the role of, of state actors to to combat this? Perhaps first you, Alexander, then Mona, if you want to add something to it. I mean, state actors, they they have to provide services to the population. That's the role of the state to do. But in, in fragile and conflict that affect the state, sometimes they cannot. It's not only that they don't want to or that they don't care. It's that they don't have the means or, or the resources to do so. And or, or for example, in, uh, in I'll talk about Syria, in some regions, uh, the, the government is not there. They don't have the power there because the armed non-state actors are there. So the government can't reach those areas. Uh, so then, the, in, for example, the Salvation Government in, uh, in North Syria, they are, they, they are in control of certain areas. And in those areas, they're trying to gain legitimacy. Uh, so then the state actors uh, or the state sometimes cannot provide services. Uh, and sometimes also it, the rural areas are too far for them to reach. Uh, so it, 
I would say this is one factor. And Mona, if you would like to add something to that. This is a difficult question for me. Yeah. We have three, four governments in Yemen. Um, one of them is the international recognized government, which is um, not living in Yemen, uh, resulting in hotels in Saudi Arabia. We have the other um, uh, rebels in uh, the Houthis who are arresting uh, patients and doctors. Um, and then we have in the South, uh, during the pandemic, while we had the pandemic and we had the flooding and we had the war, and then we had another uh, group, the Southern Transitional Council, who also um, uh, uh, decided to uh, declare self-rule and also fight with the government, which is they are part of. So now we have so many different um, conflicts. So during all of that, none of them were responsible. None of them took the 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 responsibility or had any mercy on the on the citizens uh, and the families of um, in Yemen. So I think that. Um, um, we um, we had a, we had an aha moment at the beginning, where everybody was really agreeing and um, uh, responding to the UN Secretary General's uh, um, call for um, ceasefire um, around the world, and uh, we really thought that that would have been the the, the best uh, opportunity, uh, but uh, unfortunately um, the war economy in Yemen, uh, the uh, the international and regional actors and. Um, so much interference um, in, uh, going on, and there is no condemnation of or accountability for the um, uh, for the um, uh, uh, all the uh, crimes, uh, war crimes that are being committed in Yemen, and so all of that has put us in this big mess. Now we have in the the southern uh, issue. Now we have the Riyadh agreement has been for now a whole year. Uh, we hope to see some light at least there, so that we can have some peace over there. Um, but um, um, it's, it's still a, a really uh, challenging um, uh, situation to be able to have any kind of real humanitarian response at this moment. I mean, even the release of uh, the, the salaries, even that they couldn't agree on that. Now millions of people are suffering because of them. I've seen people who have, I've seen three families. One of them actually took their own lives because they could not provide for their own families. I've seen a whole village who are actually starving to death in Taz, which, which in, in an area, in a village, which wasn't really that much affected by the war. And this is already, there's already a famine in this area. So you can imagine the other areas and the other villages which are actually affected. We've seen instead of de-escalation, we've seen them, all of them, escalating and exploiting even COVID-19. Um, so it's really a disgrace to humanity. I hope to see them all, um, um, accountable for what they have uh, committed uh, towards our people. Okay. Thank you. And um, apologies, Jais, also for this, because the sun decided to show up in Stockholm for the first time in months. Um, but I want to turn the focus to foreign actors um, and how foreign actors can help and perhaps some pitfalls to avoid. And I want to continue with you, Muna, here, because I know you have firsthand experience with this. And perhaps first asking, um, what are some, some of the obstacles that, that women-led organizations face in terms of accessing donor funding? And then also, perhaps, if you have seen the, some pitfalls that foreign actors um, have fallen into when they try to help in these situations. Um, well, I think that... Um... Uh, mainly, we, we, we have two main obstacles uh, in Yemen uh, for, uh, regarding the humanitarian programming. Uh, first of all, um, the, the humanitarian um, pool of funding of the OCHA um, has many uh, preconditions which are very, very uh, difficult to access, such as, for instance, um, they have to have a budget of two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars as a, an annual budget. This is something um, very uh, difficult and it um, automatically excludes the uh, women-led organizations such as ourselves who are not able to, to provide some of that. Um, it needs to have more flexible funding. Um, uh, and, and I think that every time um, we bring the subject up, they're always speaking about capacity building and, and all of that. Although that we see that other organizations, men-led especially organizations, 
are not uh, really up to that capacity and still they are able to access those funds. So that's uh, really a big challenge. And I think especially now uh, during this pandemic, we have seen how, how challenging it is for the international organizations to access some of the areas and, uh, and, and get there. And we have seen how the youth and women were able to do that. So I think now is the time to really redesign the humanitarian um, uh, process uh, in addition to the peace process. But we also need that because it's also contributing to conflict in Yemen. Um, and uh, the other uh, point that I would say that um, the other uh, main challenge is the type of humanitarian aid also. Um, I keep trying to advocate more for the livelihoods. Um, we need to support the fisher, uh, fishermen and women. We need to support the people in, in, uh, in, uh, in the field of agriculture, um, small scale projects. The handouts that are given, uh, the cash, um, the cash itself is not enough. It's, it's keeping the people reliant on it. It's not getting to the women. It's mainly getting to the men. And that's also another, um, another issue. Um, I know for sure that people need it, but I would, um, I would really uh, redesign and restructure the humanitarian process there. And also the geographical uh, distribution uh, to have more aid in other um, areas where, uh, which are not getting it. Um, and I think there's also, uh, um, yeah. I'll stop there. I want to pass this question to uh, Panchali, because you mentioned earlier how, how CV works with this. Um, do you want to um, elaborate a little bit more on that, how CV, how CV works to address these intersections and issues? Thank you, Sophie. Yes, I would like to pick up on what was discussed in, uh, previously with, by Muna and also by Alexandra. Uh, one thing about when you were talking about the different roles of one of the armed non-state actors as the service providers, and then you are also looking at the external agency support uh, in providing fundings and capacity development. Uh, something that uh, we have been looking at uh, in the WASH sector itself is uh, understanding the roles and responsibilities of different actors, right? Like you have the policy makers, you have the service providers and the users. So they have different kinds of relationships, uh, accountability relationships with each, each other. For example, the service provider provides services to the communities and communities in return provide uh, the payment for those services. Uh, but there is also sometimes the communities and users act as the service providers. So we call it as an accountability triangle uh, uh, that uh, different accountable relationship between these uh, different stakeholders. Some Something uh, recently uh, CV along with UNICEF and WHO is working towards its accountability framework in the fragile context. Uh, we recently had a webinar um, and I would share uh, the links and details to all the participants later, but something that we are trying to look at how this accountability triangle changes in context to uh, fragile situations and uh, fragile context. So this is very interesting because what we have been discussing previously about different service providers and actors uh, featuring in, for example, uh, the role of external support agencies becomes so crucial in fragile context uh, when the capacity of the service provider uh, and the government is not uh, adequate to be able to reach to the people. So then uh, it's kind of like a change in the dynamics of accountability relationship, right? And something that Muna had talked about and I had mentioned that building capacity and also not just building, but accessing the capacity of uh, local support agencies that you need to build in terms of armed conflict when there are crises, the humanitarian aid um, supporters cannot reach to a lot of uh, uh, regions uh, due to uh, either conflict or even, for example, during COVID due to lockdown. There are a lot of different issues that you cannot reach to and when you need to depend on the local support, like you need to depend on the community organizations, you need to depend on those local support and implementing agencies. Uh, it's also looking into in context, um, I think, um, when we are talking about the financial uh, and funding support, uh, uh, recently, in, during this accountability framework webinar, it was discussed um, that often a lot of the funding is uh, targeted at uh, the emergency, like short term, and it's not looked into long term. So then it's kind of like when you're putting so much money in the short term uh, interventions, you don't have enough money left to continue that intervention, right, for the sustainability of that intervention. So that has been one of the key issues that 
uh, has been linking around and has been debated and discussed around in the wash sector is how you create a balance between the humanitarian aid emergency responses with that of the development uh, programs, right? So this is something that uh, CV we have been working towards in terms of understanding this accountability relationship between different actors. Um, another one that I would uh, really uh, like to emphasize when we were talking about uh, uh, women in context to access to uh, water services, something uh, we had done a case studies, uh, some of my colleagues had actually done a case studies uh, uh, in Bogota and um, in, also in South Africa in some regions where they were looking into uh, women water and corruptions uh, and then there is this terminology that has come as sextortion, uh, where you kind of, there is exploitation of women uh, in exchange for uh, sexual favors uh, in return, not just for money, for the services that, that are provided. So this is something that has been also seen in the water sector, uh, where you see the service providers, uh, uh, utilities or formal informal service providers are actually exploiting women for providing water services. So this is also a one of, I think, the Transparency International had done in relation to aid services. Like when you're providing humanitarian aid, you need your name to be listed uh, to be able to access those aid. There is also uh, instances where in MENA they were seen that um, uh, women face this kind of abuses in uh, IDPs in camps where they are not able to access to aid uh, because there is abuses to able to get their names listed uh, as like uh, getting services from the aid. Uh, response. So yeah, these are some of the issues and I think there is more that needs to be investigated uh, around understanding the sextortion around in water, the corruption around in water and also in, in humanitarian aid during health crisis. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think this leads us into the topic uh, of a question we have from the audience, uh, which is, could you give us an example of how different players are using water as a tool or weapon? Um, and also, if we could include the gender aspect that you have touched upon here, Panchali. Uh, I want to start with you, Mona, and perhaps if you want to add something to that, then Alexandra. I think Panchali can answer this a bit more as she's uh, gone into it, but I have seen, for instance, the blockade. Um, and, and especially, for instance, for the, uh, the city of Taz, which is a siege city, it's been blocked for, um, for the past four years, nearly five years now. In this city, um, um, uh, there is already scarcity of water from before, and um, uh, the rebels were uh, the Houthi rebels uh, blocked each side. And I, I've seen this. I, I lived through the siege uh, for a couple of years, and it was really devastating that they would not allow the water trucks to enter to to, to the city. Um, uh, it will only enter to certain parts of the city. So this is one of the, the ways that I remember um, uh, a, a really uh, devastating case where they, they, uh, they actually fought the women at, you know, uh, there were some women there who were trying to access the water and they actually had sticks and they pushed them around and they hit them. And it was really devastating to see that. Um, so this is something which is uh, really uh, an issue with the blockade itself uh, uh, in, in Yemen in general. And I think that uh, also fuel has been um, something which has really um, uh, been used uh, by both sides of the party um, and um, even by the coalition uh, and in some areas fuel is not getting in. And so I think that um, uh, and that, of course, is affecting the water wells, and uh, which are dependent um, on that. So um, I think they have, they have, in Yemen, every single way uh, to exploit and to um, create suffering for the Yemeni people has been used in every single way. Um, so unfortunately, but I think also Panchali can give us more detail on that, or my colleagues. Please, Panchali. Yes, I'll, I'll try my best to, yes, talk about uh, some of these um, uh, issues. Uh, and one, one thing I also wanted to, um, when we were talking about, and I think the question that talks about uh, is how the water is used as um, a weapon of war. Uh, it's kind of quite uh, how the control and what Alexandra had earlier mentioned about the whole issue of legitimacy. Uh, this is just my thinking, and I was just uh, trying to see how this really works out is like when we work in terms of watch programming and sector development, there is 
not much coordination and interactions with uh, what is going on in terms of peace negotiations, more looking into the sustainable peace along with sustainable development, right? There is still a gap and it's worked in silos, like you need to work together, especially in fragile context. Uh, how important it becomes that um, these armed non-states uh, actors are not able to use it as weapon or they are not using the control over people. It's also the control of the area right with control of resources you're also controlling the area and the people so i think it's more of uh, having this um, coordination approach like when i was talking about humanitarian emergency units with that of wash program units need to work together it's also with how the peace process has worked uh, i don't know how it is i mean we need to investigate and research more around that or if anyone in the audience has really done some of the work around that would be really interesting to see how it features around with the peace processes that is worked and how how this kind of services improving sectors in fragile context uh, feature in this kind of peace processes and negotiation and then also i think comes uh, at the larger transboundary discussions right Yes, thank you very much. And as um, as you say, we welcome the, the public to, to par take part of this discussion. Uh, so please type your questions or comments and thoughts, because uh, we are very curious to hear it. Uh, and in the meantime, I want to ask um, uh, you, Alexandra, because um, uh, this paper was published three weeks ago, uh, but you finished writing it a lot earlier. Um, what can you say about how the situation has unraveled since you wrote this study? You said a few things in the beginning, but if you want to expand a bit on that. Yes, thank you, Sophie. Um, I, I did mention some examples from Syria and um, Iraq earlier, uh, but I mean, the, the, the in Syria, I know that uh, the cases are rising. They are generally in most regions in the world, but it's even more sensitive when it's uh, it's in, in a country that's affected by conflict and has been for a very long time. So the health services are not prepared to deal with it, uh, let alone the fact that they don't really have access to water. As um, I think Michelle also mentioned it earlier, a Luke water station was uh, damaged and the water was cut off to uh, Al Hasake Gornet. And that a loop water station provides water to half a million people, including three IDP camps. So, you know, and one of those camps is Al Hold Camp, uh, where there's a lot of um, women and children who are affiliated with the Islamic State. So, and we've seen also that uh, in the, the report that I mentioned earlier, that, that there's a mention that uh, ISIS is or IS is. Um, they're encouraging people to riot, you know, because they take advantage of the situation. They're not, they're, they're not providing you the care that you need and the sanitation needs that you have. Uh, and of course, this is, uh, the, it's important to provide sanitation, but when the water is not there, that creates new issues. And last I heard, they, they were trucking in water into Al Hasake to provide the, uh, the communities with the water. But how long can you do that? And what if they also, what if the unknown state actors have uh, um, take control of these water tanks, what would that entail and so on. So, I mean, water uh, is, it's important in any context, but especially so when it's a pandemic and it's a virus that you can actually, you, you need you need water and soap to wash. Um, I think that's a little bit uh, about that, but, but water as a weapon, I mean, I'm not an expert in that topic, but for example, also, uh, uh, I think it was last year, uh, at Topka Dam, when, when I, uh, Islamic State were losing um, areas, uh, they, they, they actually would damage uh, uh, the region and leave uh, the infrastructure in a very bad state so they could be used. And Topka Dam was one of them. They bombed it just to ensure that they, they, the, the others who came in uh, couldn't use uh, that uh, to provide the water resources for the population, which creates stress, of course, in, and especially in a desert climate like that. Thank you. And um, I want to come back to you, Muna, and because you are very active in the civil society. And I want to ask, because one thing that really caught my mind when I was reading this study by Alexandra Panchali and Martina um, is that you um, have helped to bring some facts to it. And one, one thing that really caught my attention is that uh, in the areas under Houthi control in Yemen, 
the, the COVID-19 patients, including women with no proper sanitation, were allegedly arrested in an initial attempt to combat the pandemic by containing infected persons. Would you like to elaborate on that, Moon, if you, if you can? Yeah, but it was very terrifying, you know, in um, in, in uh, highly controlled areas specifically. Uh, the way that, I mean, in, in general, in Yemen, but um, uh, at that time, the way they respond, and I think this has happened in other countries also, uh, where uh, where it was a militarized response to the to the uh, to the pandemic, and um, part of it is ignorance. Part of it is also we are in an active. Um, um, we, we they had at least thirty four active um, battlefronts uh, in in Yemen during that time, and still today. And so for them to tell people to isolate themselves and to um, uh, not to go into the um, to the battles and all that was really something. It was a threat to to the to the military group itself. The way the way they were thinking because they're always mobilizing thousands of fighters. So uh, so that's one thing. Uh, so they first at the beginning they said there's nothing in Yemen, and um, uh, it hasn't reached yet. It's not there. And I don't know what and and so they uh, so uh, that was the first thing. Then the next thing was that they actually um, uh, detained people and they arrested them. Uh, military was um, uh, their um, groups were everywhere in the streets. They locked up uh, whole uh, streets and people in there. It was very terrible. And and the other part was also um, in the borders between the south and the uh, south and the north. There was also uh, they tried to make like an isolation uh, area there. And that was like imagine like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who had ca uh, who came from Saudi Arabia or from Egypt from coming back um, from these countries or any other countries, and they were all stuck in these inhumane uh, areas. Um, and this was all because both sides really took it in a very militarized way. Um, they were not thinking of uh, the uh, how to really respond it and uh, correctly. We still have people who are still detained um, and in very um, difficult conditions. One of the things that the women uh, have, or, uh, have also worked uh, on a lot since the pandemic uh, broke in Yemen is um, releasing detainees. Uh, we managed to before the UN um, to uh, release during the pandemic on its own around 450 detainees because we knew that um, an outbreak of the uh, of the virus within the prisons which are already not suitable for uh, for the people would be a threat to um, to all of Yemen so that was one thing that we also worked um, upon but it's just so many issues and so many multi-layered challenges and, and and without any support without even any recognition or acknowledgement even from um, and uh, they were just making our lives even more difficult by um, by by threatening um, the people who, who were outspoken, by threatening uh, advocates, uh, peacemakers, uh, people who were calling for ceasefire. So um, it wasn't just um, detaining people, but it was also even campaigns on social media and other things. And you said in the, the beginning at the in these stress situations, women are often the first to respond. But you also mentioned uh, that the youth come second. Uh, would you like to say something about that? Yes, we have uh, really great youth in Yemen um, and uh, they have done a really, really good role. Um, uh, not everybody is fighting in Yemen. Uh, people are helping each other. Uh, I mean, sometimes I'm asked, um, how can people live still live with all of these conditions without salaries without the, and i keep saying that people in yemen are collaborating together neighbors are taking care of their uh, other neighbors people um in the diaspora are helping out uh, so we still have that and i'm really proud of um uh, this um uh, because this is where the community comes in and um i also uh, insist that the 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 peace, peace in Yemen will not come to us from the international or, um, uh, community. They will support us, they will uh, facilitate, but the peace has to come from us, from the community level. And that's where the women and the youth and the local tribal leaders and all of them have to come in together. And I think that's really why we're really pushing for a more inclusive peace process in Yemen, because the peace process currently is based on the old school, two warring parties and a battlefield, and that's it. 
everybody else is excluded. And this is also contributing to uh, the violence where the um, armed forces feel that they are superior over the people because um, this is the way the, the, the process is designed. So I think that uh, the youth have done lots of initiatives. Uh, they created awareness. They were there to respond to the people. Uh, they risked their own lives to save the lives of uh, other people. Um, in my team, I've had um, um, many of the, our youth have been building water wells, helping out with the families, creating um, uh, a lot of um, initiatives that uh, have really, really helped the people. And I urge, I urge the international organizations to really support them. Now we go into this topic of, because uh, we have a question from the audience here um, about water as not only a source of conflict, but also um, a source of cooperation and a part of the peace process. Uh, and the question is, we all know that water has always been at the center of conflicts and wars all over the world uh, from the beginning of this life. Uh, is there not any solutions to reach fair shares of lo local water sources in conflicted countries? Um, and I guess that also goes into how can we use water in the peace process? Um, perhaps starting with you, Panjali. I think I would let Alexandra respond oh, to that because she has experiences working in yeah, water diplomacy and I think she will have some uh, good insights to share from her experiences. Thank you very well. Alexandra, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, based on research, uh, quite new research, uh, water is actually a source of cooperation. So water is an entry point to cooperation rather than conflict. And there's been talk about water wars and water conflict uh, since, uh, you know, decades ago, since the 80s, 90s, but the evidence shows that that's not actually the case. When there is a conflict on water resources, it is usually not between states, but rather at the local level, so within the state, interstate. And then again, this is also then if you're already in the state and in there's very limited resource uh, water resources, and especially as Pachali said earlier in the beginning that MENA is one of the most water stressed uh, regions in the world. So then you add that, and then if, uh, adding on to that, there's been many conflicts, and, and especially the three cases that we are mentioning in the paper. You have that as well. So you have the, you know, weak government governance, and you you have the water stress. You have in MENA two thirds of the population are youth. So you have all of these factors building into that, and then you have all these non-state actors fighting for different reasons. You know, they they all they all want the water resource because you need that for control. Uh, but you also need it to provide water to the to the population. So I, I wouldn't say that water is, you know, it creates conflict in that sense. I would rather say that they sometimes use that to either gain legitimacy by providing the water services or to try to create instability uh, by, uh, as the cases uh, in, in the examples I main, mentioned earlier, by ruin, uh, you know, destroying the water infrastructures and so on. So it's different cases, but I wouldn't say like there's water conflicts in the state to state kind of setting. Uh, water usually is actually an entry point to dialogue and cooperation, I would say. Would um, uh, Muna or Panchali, would you like to add something to that? No, I would just, uh, there was a question um, uh, directed to me, um, I think by Lubna. I just want to say that Lubna, there are no clean hands in Yemen. Uh, all of them have contributed to the, to the suffering of the Yemeni people. Um, all of them have committed horrific crimes um, in many different ways. Um, starvation, direct targeting, everything. Um, of course, I, mean, I don't want to go into the historic uh, 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 part of it, but uh, of course, during 2012, we really had um, process uh, and a progress for um, a new state building in Yemen. Uh, after the, the, the Houthi rebels um, uh, decided to do their own thing and take upon uh, arms, uh, of course, that was really uh, difficult. But after that, of course, you know, the uh, sad story where the Saudis came in and um, destroyed the rest. And so we, we, um, we are now facing even a more difficult uh, situation where it's not just the Saudis and the Houthis anymore. Now we have different non-state armed actors on the ground 
for all um, opening uh, different fronts uh, every day. So I just wanted to say that and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Muna. Um, I want to um, look towards the future a little bit. Um, can, can what we see now in this pandemic in the MENA region uh, say something about future trends, do you think? You can wave if you want the word. <laughs> I would actually jump in and um, talk about something that we had uh, not touched upon earlier, uh, and this is not uh, confined to MENA region uh, itself, but it will be also interesting to investigate. That's something from what we have been working on is looking into uh, the sanitation in public spaces, right? I mean, the COVID pandemic also brings in this whole dynamic around how sanitation facilities are, and by sanitation facility, I mean the toilets community toilets in, in, in public spaces and, uh, and in conflict and in MENA, it will be more looking into uh, also in the IDB and uh, in camps uh, where you have shared um, uh, toilets that you need to use. And this pandemic really puts uh, people in risk if you're using shared and community toilets. So this is something we had no, not discussed much. So I really wanted to bring this and also uh, get some insights also from Mona if she has something uh, to talk about that. Uh, this is a study we are doing with uh, Inter-America Development Bank. Uh, a colleague of mine, she had done some field work to understand uh, the sanitation in, in relation to the human rights um, based approach, the human rights framework for water and sanitation. Uh, so this is also something that the outgoing UN Special Rapporteur Leo Heller, he is very, very vocal about it. And he has uh, really talked and emphasized and highlighted the need, and especially now with the pandemic, how we really need to also look into this uh, public spaces uh, uh, and, and sanitation facilities. And in relation to gender, this is very interesting because um, the study my colleague, she, uh, she was doing uh, in um, San Jose and uh, in Edinburgh, uh, she found there is a huge difference. There is a huge inequality when you just look into the uh, setup of these facilities, right? The sanitation facilities. Uh, and also sometimes looking into the number of toilets for men is more as compared to number of toilets for women, uh, even the whole structures, how it is being made. Uh, and this is not just limited to infrastructure alone, but also around looking into governance, like uh, who is responsible for this uh, providing services at this public spaces? Who are the users? Who are we looking into the migrant population, those homeless population, and also um, those working on the streets uh, or the day laborers that they're working. So there is this whole dynamic of understanding uh, this accountability relationship and who is doing what and what providing the services. So this is a very important uh, aspect that is not discussed much, but which is also needed. Um, for example, in uh, Northeastern Syria, I think the CARE International have done a survey where the response is like 90% of the respondents stated that they use shared toilets. So more and more in, in like understanding needs to be done that these facilities are not, these are designed and also the governance processes are non-discriminatory and it's kind of aligned with the human rights framework. And by that, I mean, not just the availability of these toilets, but that it's, it's acceptable uh, by the culture and by the needs of uh, men and women, uh, girls. So, and also the affordability, like Muna was saying, a lot of households now uh, are facing economic crisis. They're not having good income and they're not being able to use. So the whole questions around availability to move beyond and look into the human rights of acceptability and then also affordability of, uh, this sanitation facility and that goes similar with uh, drinking water and uh, as, uh, having the affordability to get the drinking water. So this is also something I wanted to bring to the discussion that we don't talk much when we talk of the wider wash discussion that the uh, sanitation at community needs to be more wide and especially during this kind of health crisis. Yeah. Do you want to add to that Muna? I think Panchali you directed the attention to Muna here. I just want to share a quick story, um, some, some good news. <laughs> um, so um, uh, what we did in, um, in, um, in Yemen, uh, there is an area which um, there were actually, there was a lot of tension between them. Um, it was going to sp a spiral into an armed conflict. It didn't, but uh, uh, it was really tough. Um, and it was because of the water and it was because of also the fuel. And anyway, uh, what we did is we fixed the water well 
uh, and, and we turned it into a whole complete water station. And this was uh, only us, you know, with our own fundraising. And we were able to uh, provide water for nine villages in that area and um, uh, nearly 10,000 people. And um, this area now, after two years, has completely transformed. It's become a very peaceful um, area and people are all working together. So what we did is that when um, I saw one of the pictures of the girls, she was about seven and I, and she was so happy with the water station. I told her, um, I, I, I uh, told one of our teams to tell her that this is gonna be your water station and you, the girls have to look after it. So um, every time they would try to, you know, uh, take uh, over control of the water station, the little girls would stand up and say, no, this is our water station. So I kept seeing their pictures and said, these girls need to get into school. Um, I was able with uh, our friends at Madre to provide uh, for them um, um, a school, which was already built, but it was just um, um, needed rehabilitation, needed complete uh, transformation. So we transformed it. Now we have a school right next to the water station for 300 young girls. And so um, uh, I'm so happy that um, the level of, um, um, of child marriage in this area has decreased and um, the girls are back into their school. Um, and now the next project that we're doing in the same area is going to be a greenhouse where the women can also work on the agriculture and um, provide uh, for their families. So this is something that I'm really proud of. And we've been able to also now reapp uh, reapply it in another area. So it's these kind of projects which are holistic uh, really um, sustainable and bringing um, true peace uh, in the community that we really need to um, work on more. I just wanted to share that with our uh, participants. Thank you so much, Moon. And after that story, I want to uh, keep the focus on solutions here. Um, and Alexander and Panchali, you uh, come up with some uh, policy recommendations in your study. Uh, so if we first go into the, the wash and sanitation related policy recommendations. Um, Panchali, do you want to um, tell us what your, what your study found? Yes, uh, something that uh, we had also discussed this and also we have been hearing from Muna, like how the local solutions are really very important to be uplifted, right? The capacity needs to be developed. Uh, something in our study, we also found that there were uh, in the camps, the uh, women were also kind of having these small entrepreneurships, like they were um, producing and developing this um, PPP kits, wash supplies like soap, uh, hygiene, um, yeah, uh, menstrual uh, hygiene kits that they were uh, kind of with face masks. Uh, and this is not just uh, in, um, we have seen in, in different countries like where uh, women self-help group, like in India, in Nepal, they were kind of uh, producing this kind of products and they were selling it at a lower price that people could afford and also easily access it. So this is something that needs to be looked into the local solutions, like empowering local solution. And that has been one of our recommendations that how we can use uh, the uh, capacities of uh, local. And when we talk of the wider, um, we were talking of having a wash resilience uh, system. We were also talking about how we need to uh, see that sometimes in terms of dealing with uncertainties and disasters, we have seen that the communities can themselves self-organize, right? They have their own adaptive capacities. They can find solutions themselves. So it's also for the policymakers to identify and really know what, what these adaptive capacities that communities have. And some of the solutions could be picked up and upscaled, right? So these are like something that needs to be looked into at the larger long-term goal. So uh, that is, has been one of our strong focus of looking into the local solutions. Thank you. And um, the other side of your policy recommendations are on the uh, on the women's side and empowering local solutions. Uh, you write that engaging with women um, uh, on the planning and implementation of COVID-19 responses could lead to more sustainable results from such programs. Um, and do you want to expand on this, Alexander? Uh, yes, thank you, Sophie. Um, I mean, first, I, we also want to clarify that we're talking, in, in our paper, we're talking about a gender transformative approach. And that is different from a gender sensitive approach, which is usually what is talked about in development aid and uh, so on. Uh, a gender sensitive approach 
uh, has a gender awareness. It understands that there is inequalities and so on due to you know the role of women and men in society, but it doesn't really change what's what's happening or what's there already. It just shows an awareness that okay, this is how the situation is, and you know this is, we're aware of this. But a gender transformative approach, however, is trying. It has strategies to address these issues. It tries to change the status quo of power relations between men and women, and the perceptions of what is uh, the role of a woman in society and what is the role of men, and so on. So, and I think that's the most important approach because. You know, gender equality is not a new agenda. It has been talked about for decades and so on, but still we're not there. And the UN clearly says that, you know, gender equality is the prerequisite to achieve all the other sustainable development goals. So that's just the first. And also, you know, like new research from the World Bank and UN, it, it, it's a, a paper called the uh, um, uh, sorry, it's a report called uh, Pathways to Peace, where they exclusively state that you know, women, women's inclusion in peace processes is very much important. So we know that we, for peaceful and sustainable societies, women's inclusion is key. Um, and to do that, you also cannot only show an awareness of gender inequality, you need then a gender transformative approach to change who has power. And also in this specific case, who has uh, access to funding, for example. But beyond that, uh, women, they, have a, they play a very vital role in crisis response, in emergency response, in disease outbreaks, uh, not only because they have this informal role as water and care providers for the community, but, but, uh, but also because they're sometimes the mediators. Um, as men, um, mentioned by Muna, she gave clear examples of that. They mediate between the different groups and also they can reach areas that other groups cannot and especially that humanitarian agencies cannot. Uh, uh, so therefore we need to include women to have sustainable results and also to reach the most vulnerable communities. But beyond that, I think it's also, you know, a part of the inclusive agenda. So if you want to be inclusive, then you, you also need to be include women and you also, you know, including women who have the local understanding and perspective and they understand the communities better. That's important because then you can ensure that the project is not failed. A lot of projects are being implemented without actually consulting the people that they're trying to help. Um, and, you know, um, women also play a vital role in preventing radicalization in their societies. This is evidenced by research from uh, uh, the OSE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the United Nations Development Programme. So, you know, th th this is another factor, especially in MENA. Uh, so th these are all factors that you need to, that you need for sustainability, because if you're in a fragile conflict uh, affected setting, then, you know, if there's, instabilities or insecurities, then radicalization can increase, which we have seen in some uh, regions in the world, you know, uh, Al Qaeda was there, then they disappeared, and then there was more instability, and then Islamic states gained traction, and the re re they had a huge power for a while there, so it's important to have women there, because they, they, they are, they play a vital role in many, many different aspects. Thank you. And I think you touched upon most of the topics because uh, we have another question from the audience here. But I want to make sure we, we get all of the aspects in this uh, question. So I will read it out loud and then perhaps you could wave if you want to answer it and add to it. Uh, and it says, could you reflect a bit on the different needs, interventions and the role of women uh, and solutions, recommendations for the short term emergency humanitarian context versus longer term development and sustainable context? Thank you. What's the question? <laughs> uh, and I would love to hear all of your uh, answers of this, but perhaps start with uh, Alexander, if you want to add something to what you just said, and maybe then Muna for the more local perspective. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I, as I just mentioned, there's so much that women can contribute to. And, you know, I also want to say that what I've seen so on, like we, we know that the, there's gendered consequences of conflicts, there's gender consequences of disease outbreaks and, or any emergencies generally that, and it's important to look at, okay, how are women actually affected and how are different kinds of women affected? Because you know, women are not all the same, you know, they, depending on the socioeconomic backgrounds, et ethnic belongings and so on and so on. There's so many factors you need to look into. You need to look at the intersectional um, intersections of that person's identity. Um, 
but but beyond that like for me and i think uh, all of us can agree that it's important to not only highlight women's role uh, as victims of a, a pandemic or any crisis it's also okay how can we ensure that women you know, we, we, we can identify how women are negatively impacted, but how can we also assure that women can positively contribute to these, uh, like to the emergency responses, or in this case, to the uh, pandemic responses? How can we ensure that the capacities and knowledge that women have, because they do have it, how can we ensure that they actually get to play a vital role? And, and having like, for example, like Mona was saying, proper funding, that's, that's important. I think this is the perfect opportunity to pass this to Muna. <laughs> well, I mean, if it was for me, I would just let the women lead. <laughs> just leave it to them. Let them lead and support them, uh, facilitate for them, provide more flexible funding. But I just want to emphasize it's not just the funding. It's also the access. It's also the spaces. It's also the advocacy. It's also the media um, to highlight their role. Um, and, and all of this um, combined um, is, is really needed to have a holistic approach to, uh, to better uh, emergency response. Uh, so I think we can start from, uh, from there. I have seen uh, recently um, a, a big change in, uh, in, in mo more in uh, policymakers and um, uh, also in international organizations and local organizations and their collaboration. I think th this, um, this pandemic has really changed the narrative, and I'm really happy to see that um, it's uh, it's it's gradual, but it is happening. It is happening, and I think that um, uh, this pandemic has, of course, um, I mean, it will sooner or later it will go, but it will definitely leave scars. And the only people who really know how to deal with and heal with those uh, those scars are really the women at the community level. So let's give them that uh, because it's not just about the pandemic. It's not just about supporting hospitals or patients. It's also about reducing the violence and preventing uh, more uh, violence from outbreaking. It's about um, the safety of our communities. And it's not just about the conflict areas. It's also affecting the whole world. And this is how we should approach it. And it's not just something about Yemen or Syria or Iraq. It is um, a threat to, um, to the world. So I think um, one of the most important things is that we start um, relocating our humanity, first of all, and start rethinking how we can really prevent and uh, better respond and also uh, to, um, to give more um, responsibility and empowerment of the communities for them to also um, um, reconnect together and, and heal their communities. Um, I keep saying that these handouts and it's not enough, it's not, it's, it might be even working um, in, in the wrong direction because we're um, encouraging them instead of to, to really work together and collaborate and, and rely on themselves, we're really um, actually putting them in a, um, uh, in the wrong direction sometimes, unfortunately, with, with good intention. So this is where we uh, need to think. And I'm, I'm really happy to be in this, um, in this webinar because um, I, I've noticed that when we're, um, the water practitioners and water dialogues are really, the way they, uh, these people think is really um, something that we really need to hear more of um, because um, I mean, when you hear like Manchali or Alexander, you really think of these, um, of climate change and of, um, of water dialogue in a very different perspective and not the narrow perspective that we're actually seeing. So we really need to um, amplify these voices even, uh, even more. We need them at the local level. Thank you. And in, in your perspective, Muna, what kind of action would you like to see from, from Swedish or international act actors? Um, well, um, I think Sweden has a big role in, in for instance, in Yemen, um, um, from the uh, policy and peace um, uh, tracks, that's one uh, big thing is that do not allow those negotiators to come back to Sweden again without the women with them. Um, and uh, that's really important because that's uh, in the negotiation tables, that's where the decisions are made that affect all of our lives. Um, another main thing is, uh, for instance, um, CEDA, for um, the other international organizations who have been working in Yemen and contributing and supporting uh, the UN, 
uh, we need to see, um, for instance, the grand bargain um, uh, more uh, into, uh, into action where uh, the women-led organizations um, have access to that kind of pool of funding. And not just the funding, it's just the, the also the flexibility of the funding and, and, and let the women-led organizations choose for themselves what the priorities are. This is really important. So um, we need that kind of coherence between the donors and, and the work on the ground. Thank you so much. Uh, we have five minutes left of this webinar uh, and we have one more question from the audience, but I also wanna make sure we have time in the end uh, to take a round and uh, as we have the pleasure of having policymakers and practitioners present in this webinar, I want to take the opportunity and ask all three of you in the panel um, the same question. Uh, so I will give you two questions at once. First, we have uh, the question from the audience. Uh, in case of occupation, uh, in case of occupation of territories, who provides the population with water? So I want one of you to answer that very quickly. And then I want to take this round and ask, what are your main messages to policymakers on how to take action on these matters? So first, uh, the question of occupation of territories and who provides the population with water. Who wants to briefly answer on that? I can go briefly. Uh, uh, we have been discussing that and we had mentioned about different actors play different roles. Uh, and sometimes you don't even have the data, right? Who is doing at the ground level? Like there are so many informal service providers at the ground level that it's very difficult to um, monitor and also see um, if they are actually following the rules and regulations in terms of uh, providing the services and not just the services, but also sometimes it's about um, uh, in certain countries, when you have water being used as groundwater, like you don't have a control and you are yeah, pulling a lot of groundwater. So there is no regulations on use of groundwater. So when there are like a lot of uh, informal actors, it becomes uh, quite a, a challenge. Uh, something that we had discussed and Alexandra had mentioned about is like the armed non-state actors. Uh, while we were doing these studies, we found that they were very much involved in providing a lot of uh, different taking the control and providing services around health, having control of those services. We were also trying to find out how it is for the water services itself. Uh, so we didn't really get that many data to really uh, push that, okay, for the water wash sector itself, there are this many uh, areas that are actually serviced by uh, armed on state actors because it's controlled uh, area. So it's kind of quite difficult also to gauge how uh, the service provisions are there. So it's kind of like, that is what we were mentioning about how we need to really have this mapping of who is doing what, the responsibility and accountability relationship. And there are like a lot of tools and like we were mentioning the accountability tool in the sector that you could use and do it with multi-sex stakeholder uh, engagement. We have uh, guidelines, uh, we can share a link that you can use to really map and understand how the uh, scenario is in terms of service provision uh, in that area. So this is something, um, CV and all, there are also other global organizations that really emphasize on, on first in even OECD in the water governance principle of looking into clear roles and responsibility. Uh, yeah. In your second question, quickly, I can touch upon is looking into and something that feeds into what we have been discussing about why policymakers need to emphasize and look into sex disaggregated data. Uh, this has been talked about in most discussions, but in practical implementation on operational level, it's not seen so that it can inform policies and programs uh, and also in the immediate responses during health crisis, right? You know the needs, uh, how people are responding, what's the impact on men and women, what's the impact on those population with reduced mobility, on the youth, young girls, um, how it is in situations in schools when uh, it was from lockdown when people had to uh, open the schools and then what's the sanitation and water facilities in schools, uh, those kind of things, right? The sex disaggregated data is very important and crucial that uh, policymakers use. And I would like to cite this example of the World Water Assessment Program uh, Gender Toolkit that they have uh, lots of water indicators and gender indicators that helps in informing the policymakers using such disaggregated data. And that also reflects to in the initial remark of Muna when she was saying about how we need to learn from different health crises like from Ebola to be able to respond to. So if you don't have the data, if you don't have, it will be very difficult to really uh, learn from uh, previous experiences. So it's more important to get this kind of data 
uh, during this health crisis and also in your response measures. Thank you. Thank you. And we're reaching the end of the seminar, but I want to quickly make the round. So first, uh, Alexandra, same question. Uh, and then um, we finish with Muna. So please, Alexandra. Uh, yes, uh, I'll keep it brief. I'm mindful of time. Uh, I, I think we already talked a little bit about the water providers and Panchali also touched upon it now. So I won't respond to that question because I don't have anything else to add. Uh, my main messages would be to actively involve the various actors and actively involve the different kinds of women from various communities. Uh, but it's very important that they're, they, they, because they understand the local context. So when you try to implement the COVID-19 response and make sure that you have them there at the decision-making table, but also by, uh, by getting uh, funding, just to ensure that the response is tailored to the needs of the communities that you're trying to help. Uh, and also I wanna uh, also add that um, UNDP um, and the UN Women uh, released a COVID-19 global gender response tracker and you can see it and then you can actually uh, actually see what countries are doing uh, and if they have gender sensitive uh, approaches to their responses and the majority of them do not. Uh, so I would recommend all the viewers to go into it uh, and see. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And Muna, any final words before we wrap up? No, I just, um, I just want to thank you all. I think we've covered um, all that I wanted to cover. And um, I think that uh, the recommendations uh, by the study is really, really important and within line with all our needs um, as locals. And I think that um, uh, policymakers just um, need to uh, facilitate more of these kind of discussions and listen more and start to take action and um, not be afraid, take the chance. Take, um, I mean, um, there are some really good lo um, local organizations who are able to have more impact. Let's give them that kind of opportunity to prove themselves and to um, uh, have more efficiency, especially in uh, the situations that we are in. Um, just wanted to say that thank you, Sophie, for your excellent moderation. Um, thank you for all our participants and the excellent questions and Dr. Martin and all of my uh, colleagues um, at uh, CWE and the um, uh, distinguished uh, guests and participants. And um, thank you once again for shedding some light on Yemen. And I just hope that people read this study and, um, um, and, and start to really take some action um, I think um, if we start really um, using these recommendations, we will see um, some change. But the problem is that um, during just the past six or seven months, so many policy papers have been um, published, but still people are not um, uh, really taking them. So I think that um, this is really important. Thank you so much. Thank you, Muna, and thank you to everyone in the panel for your insights. And of course, uh, thank you everyone who sent your questions and input and took the time uh, to participate in this webinar in the audience. And I hope you leave this webinar with new knowledge uh, and a good sense on how to move forward to this matter. And uh, I will leave over to Martina now for the final wrap up. I just would like to say thank you all very much for joining us and thank you very much, Sophie, for excellent moderation. You were an absolute star and so were all the other panelists. So thank you all. And I really do hope that this is not the first event we do together. And let's really think how can we further advance this very important topic. So thank you very much and have a great weekend. Bye bye.